for us, I think the year 1960 is just one of the landmarks of our family. Mm -hmm. And that's when we came, uh, or the, we went to Lombard, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And the reason, the only reason I mention that is that an associate minister of the church we attended was taking courses at the seminary of the Church of the Brethren. And this seminary was at 3444 West Congress Parkway. And during the course of our involvement with that church, he told us that the seminary was moving out and that there was going to be a new organization that moved into it. And at that church, we were called Group One for whatever reasons. And he told us about courses that this new group had and that perhaps we would be interested in taking them too. So we, uh, we actually went to the, uh, the Order Ecumenical at 3444 West uh, Congress Parkway before it was ours that we attended lectures, and I can't remember, I think uh, we attended a, a, a lecture one time by a son of, of Karl Barth, or some important theologian uh, was, uh, was going to speak at 3444 West Congress Parkway. And so we, uh, we were involved uh, then before it ever became the Ecumenical Institute. Then, uh, when the Institute moved to the West Side, Lombard became one of the satellite cities for uh, weeknight courses. And I believe Shirley uh, was, were you the hostess for one of these uh, weeknight courses? Uh, Nancy uh, Loudermilk, was one of them, for instance. And well, anyhow, uh, we became involved in these courses, weeknight courses. Then also, the Institute was interested in telling its story. So I recall in about 19, I think about 1965, going to the First United Methodist Church of Glen Ellen, which was right next to Lombard, and hearing Charles Hahn speak in a Sunday service. And so we, uh, we uh, became interested uh, in the Institute uh, these various ways. We were, we were uh, shall we say, less than divinely happy with the Methodist Church in Lombard. It was sort of um, pale, shall we say. And after coming from Wesley Church in Urbana, the Church of the Wesley Foundation. In Illinois. Uh, pale. Anyway, we, we arrived in Lombard and we quickly became the other group. We were group one and there was group two, people who were interested in study. And, uh, we definitely were the other group because they wanted to study all the Methodist material and everything the minister told them to do. I don't know, there was something about the group that didn't quite go that way. So, we took courses. We started, you know, it was not long before courses were available, not only on weeknights. And I took RS1 on a weeknight in, in uh, Lombard, as I recall. Maybe it was Elmhurst, but I think it was in Lombard. Yeah, I think it was at the uh, First United Church. Oh, yes, right across, the, yeah. Yeah, right across from the First Methodist. You, you took it separately from Wendell. Yes, she took it first. We took almost all the courses separately, and we had a team with another family called the Carlsteads, who have always been great colleagues of the Institute. 
and they they wanted to take the courses too, of course, and so they would leave one of them home to care for their children, and we would leave one of us at home to care for our children, and the other two would go wherever the course was. We had our children in 1959, 61, and 63. So just exactly at the time the Institute was forming was when we had our children. Uh, the other thing uh, which, which <clears throat> I find enormously uh, important for younger people is to realize that in 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy became the President of the United States. And this was an enormous event. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> And then in 1963 with his assassination, and then with the assassination of Robert Kennedy, after that Martin Luther King, student unrest and so forth. Uh, I mean it was just an enormously uh, exciting time in America. And the Institute had at that time decided it would locate on the west side in mm. the former seminary and there were a lot of people living and working there at the time of the death of Martin Luther King and of course the city broke out and riots and all of that went on but the Institute because of I, I've always felt because of what they had done it, with children and families and all the work they had done in the neighborhood with Fifth City uh, was not was not badly hurt in that set of riots. They escaped quite <clears throat> quite well. We were doing courses helping the Institute. We were taking courses ourselves. Uh, there were teachers courses for instance which I took. Uh, people like Fred Hess uh, who was, uh, a couple of others would visit us. Shirley, because she did not work, would set up um, appointments for, for uh, usually clergy, so that with if they, uh, with, and would go with Fred uh, on them. We so, must have done <clears throat> 50 calls together, hmm. recruiting clergy for courses, PLCs primarily. And by the time we finished, it was absolutely hilarious. One hot spring evening, he said, well, he was sitting in our living room, he said, I have something I'd like to talk to you two about. And it was like, we'd already discussed this. And we sort of enjoyed watching him sit there and squirm. But we didn't help him much. We just let him struggle with how he was going to get this said. and. He wanted to know if we'd come and live in the new facility on Blue Island Avenue that was going to be the first religious house that, well, it was not the first. There was another one down on the lake shore that was really classy that Fischl had opened in. Near, yes, near the University of Chicago. Yes, I mean it was it was very nice. But the, this house that we were going being invited into was just a touch different, shall we say? It was more in the true tradition of uh, that I think of with the institute. You know. So we had a great relationship with a wonderful architect from the North Shore Cadre, uh, Hill. Sheldon Hill. Sheldon Hill, yes. Uh, came over and said, well now, you know, this place has real possibilities. And I thought, oh, Sheldon, I usually have that line, but I must say this one escaped me. So he, <laughs> he proceeded to tell us how we were gonna turn this into a great facility. And fortunately, Fred Hess was a very skilled carpenter, mm -hmm. and I was a very willing painter, and so it all worked out, and we, we did. We created quite a tolerable facility there. 
And, 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 and what year was that that you finally moved in? Well, he asked us in 1968, and we told him uh, that for everyone's benefit, we would stay in the suburbs uh, one more year. And so I believe we actually interned at the South House. And actually, we arrived several days before it officially opened. So we were there from the beginning. Before Be the beginning. Before, yeah, before the beginning. Uh, and, and then, uh, yes. And, but this would have been in 1969. That would have been in 1969. The other thing is uh, that people have to uh, realize <coughs> How, uh, how America was reacting to civil rights in the 1960s so that when many people were fighting to stay in the suburbs, Shirley and I had decided we do not want to raise our three children in a lily white upper middle class American suburb. Yeah, uh, that that did, did not strike us as as being a responsible thing to do, so that we were clear in some respects what we were doing. That I tell people, if you want to do something, do it. So that for the St. John's, for instance, the integration of Chicago public schools happened the first week in September, 1969 with the arrival of three lily white children, David, Ann, and Jane St. John, to a primary school where about half of the kids were black and half of them were Mexican, and then the, the, these three. And since then, they have been fully integrated in the school system. And so we saw, again, the uh, Ecumenical Institute as a vehicle for our beliefs. At the same time, many people, as a matter of fact, some people would come to us when we were in Lombard and say, we have left Chicago and now we've lived here for about 15 years or so. We do not want Lombard integrated that would only mean we would have to move again further from Chicago. So there were a lot of people uh, <clears throat> who, of course, did not want this integration. But Shirley and I thought it was the thing to do. My first thought about that is that we as Americans had never seen presidents assassinated on a popular street in a popular American city. That was unheard of. And we, we could not believe that somebody actually killed our hero of the Black Revolution. I mean, all of this was just un, unbelievable. And it drove you up against the mystery. It drove me up against the mystery. And it meant that I was looking for something that was going to meet that hunger that I, that I felt. Mm. Mm. And I could see when I went to the Institute that mm -hmm. things like the crazy morning office mm. had that possibility because mm -hmm. it happened every day. It was great. And then there were the, the meal times. I mean, there was so much that helped sustain my, my sense of passion for a cause that I had come to believe in very intensely. The mm. cause of creating a new society. And I think for me, uh, there were a couple of phrases that, that really held some of that, and that was uh, a new social vehicle and a new religious mode, mm -hmm. that the two go hand in hand. And for me, 
I think I'm, I'm always more interested uh, initially, anyhow, in what's happening historically. So what gets my attention is what's happening. And it seemed, and of course, as we said, the 1960s had enough happening for, uh, for all of us uh, and then some. So that at the same time, you did have a religious mode freighting this new social reality. And the two I just saw as, as one. They were just interwoven. They were part and parcel the same. And so today, this is maybe getting ahead of the story, and we can you know, go back and forward. Uh, today, it seems that people are reluctant to embrace either. That I'm just amazed. Shirley and I see the news all the time. Uh, in the 1960s, we were shocked by these events, these historical events. Well, in, the, in, in 50 years later, we're equally shocked by what's happening to the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. That British petroleum is, is, uh, is, is whatever you call it, is the, the oil is, is spewing in this enormous area, and I talk to people and they say, you know, the attention of most people is a week or so. So uh, this, this is no longer a reality after a little while. Well, if things like, like desecrating the planet Earth do not come into people's consciousness, then in one respect they don't need a, a new religious mode either. Because everything is just, it's fine, it's wonderful. Uh, it's, you know, why focus on, on, on uh, BP when there's this idiot kid flying a plane from Bloomington to the Bahamas? <laughs> and that's just, you know, s symptomatic of, of so many things. How, how much did you two get directly involved in the, um, the teaching of ours one? Was that part of your mission or was that something that was tangential to the other assignments that you had? That was very interesting as far as I was concerned. I think probably Wendell was a touch more involved in the teaching of RS1 than I was. But we arrived after the wave had crested mm -hmm. for teaching RS1. Mm -hmm. And if I had to say that I had an experience that evolved an expertise, it was always in the community, like um, visiting pastors and recruiting, mm. um, the, the town meetings, mm. love doing town meetings, mm -hmm. went all over the United States. I was in Iowa, I was in Louisiana. Um, this great woman and I set up all the Kentucky counties from, <laughs> would you believe it, from the other side of the river. They put us in a room and said, all right, you two know how to recruit, and your job is to sit here and recruit every county. I can hear, I can hear, um, oh, what was his name? <sighs> anyway, uh, he said, now, we are not letting you out of here until this is done. We said, oh, thanks. So we had to do a little experimenting and inventing, and it was very creative, very exciting. We had a good time. Mm -hmm. I want to go back for just a second to the RS1 question, mm -hmm. and that is, as Shirley said, um, it had been formed, we took it, and I found it an enormously helpful course, as you know, practically everyone else. Now, it was almost funny, though, as a, as a school teacher, as a high school teacher, I found it to the course itself too controlled. Now, this had nothing to, to do with the effectivity of the course. I realized that it was effective because at a certain point at, you know, on Friday night, everyone asked this question. But it was simply not my way of teaching. 
And so I had an enormous respect for people who taught the course, but I never felt comfortable teaching it myself. In that rigid of uh, structure? In style. that rigid of the structure. Mm -hmm. structure. <clears throat> the other thing <clears throat> going right along with that <clears throat> is that I always image myself as an enabler. That I often am not interested <clears throat> in playing the quote leadership role in being the first teacher in those days. And there were a lot of people who were very happy. They loved playing the role of the first teacher. But I, I really did not enjoy uh, that dimension of it. And, uh, and the same thing is true with me, and it would be interesting to see other people too, that kind of is the mode. In Bloomington, Indiana, 50 years later, if someone said, well, there are these five St. John people, what do these people do? Well, I would say, uh, Mrs. St. John does this, the three kids do this, and I'm kind of the enabler. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's how I see that. The other thing is that we did arrive after the initial wave of people from Texas. So um, I thought, and, and, uh, and I thought it was a, a good thing, that there, there was a certain sense of hierarchy in the system. And it was, it was natural. It, I mean, you know, Fred Buss never said, I'm the lieutenant and you're the, never. And, but there was a sense in which there was an authenticity <clears throat> of the people <clears throat> who, came from, uh, who came from Texas. Yeah, in terms of when people arrived in the community. When they arrived in the community. <clears throat> and I found them, and uh, I think Shirley did too, <clears throat> but I found the people just, uh, just unilaterally wonderful people. And I think that one of the great things that structure gave the Ecumenical Institute, <clears throat> which, for instance, uh, my teaching in public schools never gave me, was the emphasis that we played uh, on, we are going to emphasize the gifts of a person and minimize the ungifts of a person. And I, you know, I've, I knew some of the people I worked with, they had ungifts, but they were, they were called upon to give their, their gifts mostly. Well, my recollection <coughs> is uh, he never stopped moving. He was always in motion. And if you wanted to find him, he was either in roomy with a certain cluster of people, or he was in his apartment, or he was going out the front door. <laughs> but always in motion. <coughs> now, recently I had the opportunity to go back and work in the archives and thoughts, random thoughts I had had mm -hmm. about his sheer creative genius in creating the whole structure of the order and of the ICA, all of that was, is absolutely amazing. To see that structure and to appreciate the complexity and the forward thinking that he had done. When, for example, Wendell and I were in a group in what we, oh, I don't know, we had a subdivision of geography and we had started uh, a group within that and they became very effective and quite powerful. And it was clear to us the Institute was out to kill this group. It had to go, and indeed it did. And that was because it did not fit in the framework. It was good that it went. <coughs> it did not seem that it was good that it went when it happened, having worked my batootie off getting it up to where it was, but it was good that they did that, that that was done. And that was all Matthew's perspective on how things should be organized.
but I can remember uh, collegians in which Joe would be presenting a new piece, like a new piece of the new religious mode. It was just thrilling to see the, I mean, it sort of grew before your eyes like a, a fast film of a mushroom. It's amazing. He was a genius. That's all there was to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I had a, a similar uh, relationship and reaction to him. And uh, people who did have any kind of reservations, uh, my thought was always, well, you have to remember this man is the head of an organization with a couple thousand people. So you have to realize what he does, he does highly intentionally this was one of his pet words you know intentionality and so I uh, I personally uh, always found him brilliant and whatever he did uh, I thought was just great now right along with that and this might be getting ahead of the story too Michael but the one thing that I said to someone one time that did not ring with, did not resonate, was I said, when Matthews and the Institute, and I included myself in the Institute, that we were the best of the Industrial Revolution. In other words, there was a certain critique that I was giving to that in about 1990. And I did not mean in any way, shape, or form what that meant for another time. But I was uh, reading people like Peter Drucker and so forth who were pushing uh, the concept of what leadership meant, what organization meant, what the world was going to look like and so forth in the 21st century. My question even, even in the, in, in the 19, 80s and the 1990s was, now we have captured so well what has been happening globally from 1950 to 1975, 1980. Now what's it going to look like uh, in, in the future? And uh, I was open to the possibility that it would simply be replication. You would simply do. Uh, but uh, but I looked, I looked at Matthews uh, from that perspective, I'm sure. But at that particular time in history, I thought he was just sheer gift and sheer creativity. And if he, uh, if he did not always say things to make everyone happy, <laughs> well, you know, that's, just, that's just the nature of the fella and the nature of what he thought he had to do. You know, when, yeah. when people would come to him and, and would uh, be concerned with their children, for instance, well, what I realized was that was not his strong, strong suit, uh, dealing with children. <laughs> it's also worth mentioning at this point that the children <clears throat> were journeying along very well in this process. I was... I was almost surprised by how well they did. They loved having a group to be a part of all the time. There was always somebody else to play with, work with, be with, and that was very attractive. Yes, yeah, so from our perspective, uh, we, uh, we just had the best of all possible worlds and, the, I, and I guess you would say, if there, if there was one, the best of the order also. That where we went uh, between 19, 1969 and 1995 when we came to, to Bloomington, I think we moved about 15 different times. But it was all an adventure, really. And it, when, when you see people in Bloomington, the students moving in, with their trailers and then moving out with their trailers and, and you, you sense, you know, wherever we went, we literally 
loaded up a couple of suitcases and went. The housing was there, everything was there. Uh, and the fact that our kids, they were in structures too. Uh, the fact that we had three of them and that uh, fortunately uh, the first child played the role first children are supposed to play and that is to, to take care of the others. And, and so it was, uh, we, t during the time we were in the order, I don't, I don't think we had any. And the, the question of money, Shirley and I were never, you know, it, uh, our question was never how much money do we have, it was like, who's going to spend it first? Uh, can we have a contest? If we have $10 today to spend, well, who can spend it first? Uh, and if we have $100 one day, that's great. If we have $10 another, that's fine. Uh, so there's, there's this, this flexibility uh, to it also. Oh, it was wonderful because it gave us an alternative about how we could articulate these deep yearnings and new ideas and the whole thing without having to go back to the archaic language that we had grown up with and it was the only language we knew. And it wasn't effective. It didn't get us where we wanted to go today. So we needed that jargon. And the question is, what is the jargon that we need, you know, for the next... Yes, time? yes, exactly that. And to see the perversions, but also the gifts. For instance, uh, we went uh, to a, well, part of the, jar of the jargon of the Institute uh, was comprehensive, intentional, futuric. And so I was so humored when... It wasn't long until I heard a dentist who had taken a course say that he was comprehensive, intentional, and futuric about the teeth of the people he, uh, he was the dentist. And I thought, you know, what a complete perversion in some respects, that when the Institute talked about the comprehensive, it was global. But somehow, so whatever jargon you have, I mean, it's open to perversions, but uh, I'm with Shirley. It, it just was so helpful to have these words that did communicate something new, that did say, hey, we're talking about something different. We can't use these you know, we can't use these words of, of the 1970s in the 1980s if we're pointing to new reality. So I thought, um, I thought, I was pleasantly pleased and I've never been too concerned about uh, being different uh, in having people say, uh-huh, uh, you must be Methodist, or you must be one of the uh, Ecumenical Institute people, the, one of the ecumaniacs, as uh, sometimes people would say. And, you know, I'd smile and say, yeah, I'm one of the, one of the ecumaniacs, and <laughs> this is what we do. So I, um, I thought the jargon was, was just part of it. And uh, today, just to bring this up to... Uh, to today, I think that that is part of what uh, of what people are struggling with today. What is the new jargon? Uh, uh, along with the what is the new cosmology? What's the new world we have on our hands? What's the uh, what are the crises? How are we going to articulate this? Because uh, we see these global phenomena. Mm -hmm. And because I guess I'd never thought of it, but perhaps because we don't have the jargon, people don't respond in kind.
Well, I think at this point I have to go back and say that we both came through an incredible journey with the Methodist Church, which at the time we were in high school was an, a fine institution and had an amazing educational division. And they were so impressed with the district of which we were a part. They came and did some programs distinctly with our district youth and came to summer camps. And we had better education than most of the Methodists of that day, or any mm -hmm. succeeding day, by the way. But that, you know, we were exploring the interior life. We were exploring prayer, a lot of things in that ex camp experience. And uh, it's hard to believe that Lake Bloomington could provide that environment, but <laughs> that <laughs> was the case. Well, it was that experience in camps and places like that. Uh, you know, that's a hard question because... Mm -hmm. See, Shirley was... A, I was clear. She was an only child. And her mother knew before Shirley was born that she was going to become a doctor. She was going to attend the University of Illinois. And she was going to marry someone of equal status. Well, of course I did half of it. Yes. <laughs> no, you didn't but become a doctor. <laughs> that's true. You got that part. <laughs> Uh, and I was, I had a left-handed kind of obedience because I entered the university as a pre-med student and I was there for a semester and I said, oh, this is, this is not my world. This is not where I want to spend my energy. I don't want to spend my life fighting with men many of whom I know are not my equal, <laughs> and I am not going to go there. So I went into the dean and said, thank you very much. I've enjoyed my year in this curriculum. Now I want to transfer. And he said, oh, another woman in pre-med. And he whipped out my record and said, but you're not having any trouble academically. Mm -hmm. I said, no, it's not academic. And he said, oh, and then started asking, well, where do you want to go? And I thought, oh, if I told you, you wouldn't understand anyway. But um, it was clear to me there was a better path, a better way to go. So, you know, all of this happened early on. I had a dawn of consciousness at an early age and what we would say today was that I was, I was uh, generally happy, happy with the indicative, whatever it was. And I had, uh, growing up, I had three brothers and I knew exactly who they were. And I knew exactly who I was. And what, for whatever reason, what I discovered was uh, the way you uh, exit Aroma Park, Kankakee slash, is through education. So beginning in the first grade, I became a model student. And I retained that model student image until I left Kankakee High School. Now, in the process, in America in the 1930s and the 1940s, people were beginning to realize, well, if you're talented, you should go to the university. Now, uh, Robert, my father, uh, had gone through the ninth grade, I believe. And so he thought, well, you probably should go to school if you want to. <clears throat> and then Alice had gone through the 12th grade and she was proud of that fact, but she would sometimes say to me, why do you want to go somewhere where you have to pay them money when 
you can work it the easy way and they will pay you money. It doesn't make sense. Now she also knew that she was not stating exactly the consensus, but it was still a brooding with her. And what I knew was, for my sanity, I needed to leave Kankakee <laughs> sooner or later. And relatively so, sooner. as relatively sooner. And I had latched on to both the school and the church. And in those days, from the perspective of those days, the school was excellent and the church was excellent. And things were, were even simplified in, Kink, in Aroma Park, maybe hmm, much simpler than Kankakee, much simpler maybe even Bloomington today. And that is that the teachers, the school board and everyone else, Monday through Friday, we were at school. Now, the school board wasn't necessarily, but the teachers were. And then we had a day off on Saturday, and then we reassembled on Sunday. So I really lived a unified life. <laughs> and as I say, it was equally fine for those days. But I was very clear uh, because that was kind of what the times were telling me too, that I needed to leave uh, Kankakee. Now, uh, interestingly enough, and this is a completely different story, but I really was not prepared by the community to leave Kankakee. So I experienced certain struggles uh, after I left Kankakee that uh, that I went to, as I tell people, translated today, uh, I should have gone to a, an Ivy Tech. I should have stayed home and gone to an Ivy Tech for a couple of years because none of my family had ever been to university, etc. But, but uh, anyhow. There was no Ivy Tech. But in those days, there was no Ivy Tech, and it did propel me. Uh, so to answer your question, it was both the school and the church. Sure. which gave us uh, vision and creativity and and they were the ones hope. who said hope and they were the ones who said uh, vocation <clears throat> is more than uh, making money at the easy way. Mm -hmm. uh, something that's happening in in the future is the emphasis in the past in some respects in religion has been what you might call uh, religiosity. Uh, and religiosity is, is usually what, what I consider to be forms, what you do, what you don't do, uh, almost even the things that you do in a church. You might you know, genuflect, you might uh, cross yourself or what. These, these can be very helpful. But more and more, what people sense they need is spirituality. And the spirituality is, <clears throat> I guess the religiosity is what you do kind of externally. The spirituality is, is how you feel that and how you experience that and with others. And it goes beyond, uh, <clears throat> in education we talk about uh, interactivity, uh, that people, that things are interactive and we create. And someone has, has recently said, well, people today have gone beyond interactivity between, and that is, it is, they want a situation in which they are immersed. And the best example of that that kind of education, which I think also points out to spirituality, being immersed in the spirit, is strangely enough, uh, the people who have created the museum for Abraham Lincoln in Illinois, that they did that conscious of the fact that the best education is through love. That, in other words, and love in a very um, 
non-sentimental way that when you bump into that museum, they want you to love what's happening. And uh, they come from, the people themselves who come from Disney World and, fr from, all, and from the world of, of, um, of creating this virtual reality. They want you to love the experience, to be immersed in it, and then they give you everything that's completely authentic relative to the life of Abraham Lincoln. And you come out of it a changed person. For me, my time in Japan was very special because there was an unusual clustering in Tokyo of alternative religion. Uh, it, it was just quite remarkable. And we in the house invited a lot of those people in. For example, uh, at the time of the equinox, we would have uh, rituals in the backyard. And the language was all new, used to call the universe, used to beckon the new that was um, clearly there that needed that we were in need of. Uh, it also gave us an excuse for having a community. And for me, this is the missing link. The words are not so important as the, as is the community. I need a group of people. There's just no two ways about it. I need to know that we are all going to gather at a certain time every day or whatever the, the decision is about when. But it's important to me that there is a community of people. And I used to think it was because I was a weak slob and I needed other people to support me. But that's not what it's about. I mean, I may be a weak slob, mind you, but um, there is a different energy. And that was what was different about so much of the religious conversation that we held in Tokyo. We talked about energy and the movement of energy among us, between us, how it was moved. Some people thought crystals made a big difference in the way energy could be moved, the mm -hmm. use of crystals. Uh, some, we met some people who had um, a great enthusiasm for uh, just the, the spirit the spirit moving in the universe and where we were going to encounter that movement of the spirit in the universe. And that's why all of these uh, lunar holidays were so por important. Because, you know, the, the energy out there was in motion. Well, you know, some of this seems a little strange, but there was some of it also that rang a great bell uh, about beginning to bring all of us in touch with a new <coughs> scientific reality that we knew all about in the world of science and we sort of ignored that we knew it. All we could talk about was the old forms of being related to spirit. But this was new and it was very exciting. And many of us became very excited. And unfortunately, it all sort of began to unravel when the ICA decided to unravel Tokyo. But it, it was a great moment and that was a window for me into 
into the possibility of a new style of spiritual communication. And since I've gotten back here, I can't find anybody who, who wants to talk in these terms. There are a few people who sort of think they want to, but they want to celebrate the weirdness. And I think, no, 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 you missed it. But that was number one. And then the second thing that has gone clunk is reading the biography of Bonhoeffer. <clears throat> this gone what? The biography. No, but this gone clunk, what does that mean? You said the second thing that... Connected. Oh, connected, I see. Um, was reading Bonhoeffer's biography and realizing how absolutely he, essential he came to find the corporate time with a group of other people. And even after he left Germany, he would pray at the same time of day that all the people in his group in the seminary that he was trying to establish were praying. It, it was very important to him to have a corporate time. <coughs> well, and you know, if somebody said, well, what about church on Sunday morning? I said, what has that got to do with spirituality? It just doesn't happen in that context very often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are the two examples I have. And the Institute, of course, told me about corporateness and the coming together of spirit and human energy and it kind of all being one big ball of wax. Human energy is spirit energy and that's a very important concept <clears throat> as far as I was concerned. I think, I think Michael, and that that is, that, that, that is where I experience my limitation. That I can experience the old, I can listen to, uh, I can listen to Sarah Wolford tell about the limitations of the educational system of today. And since she's describing the educational system not only of today but of 50 years ago when I was in it, <laughs> I understand that completely. When she starts talking about what we need to do, Grandpa, is, <clears throat> that's when I listen to her. And relative to what I've been saying to, that I do not have the language. I know, I, I know it exists, I know it will be articulated, but that is where, it, uh, as I tell people all the time, uh, relative to spirituality, whatever you want to uh, talk about, and relative to education too, if you really want to know, you're going to have to focus on, on the young people who know it. Maybe they even use the language, but I'm not privy to it. And that's um, so that, for instance, that's what I've been um, with, uh, with what, um, with what uh, Anne calls my lost men. I have a whole covey of lost men. And one of the things that I'm beginning to push them is how do you articulate what you're seeing, what you're experiencing? Because I don't. Because one of the things that has been a surprise to me is uh, Shirley and I, or at least I, thought we were going to, after we retired from the Institute, we were going to live happily ever after. And there was a man by the name of Francis Fukuyama who came out with a book in the 1990s, I believe, called The End of History. And I thought it was going to be the end of history. In other words, uh, America had become the number one power in the world. The Soviet Union had met its demise. 
the world would take a couple of maybe centuries to catch up with this. But it's basically over. Now, what we've discovered is that just the opposite has happened. That, and that's where I point to, well, one of my uh, lost men is, majored in mathematics at IU. And when he wasn't studying math, he was studying physics, chemistry, and biology. Now, when I read the age of rationalism, the age of enlightenment, what I discover is, in a lot of respects, that is no longer the reality of the world. That science in the 21st century, science itself, has completely changed. We have completely different concepts of the universe. We have you know, people started talking uh, about, what is it? Um, microbiology, not microbiology. What is the other biology? There's a, where they mix, mix chemistry and biology. Biochemistry. Yeah, bio, yes, biochemistry. And the first time I, th I heard that, I thought, what crazy thing are you talking about? There's biology, where you look into a, a microscope. Then there's chemistry, where you're doing these all kinds of silly experiments. Well, in other words, so, that, so I think part of what we're doing relative to the question of, of uh, what's the articulation of, of the new, of, of, if we don't want to use spirituality, is I don't know even what's happening on that level. And it's like, I was reading that, that for the last three centuries, we've been trying to, to create the objective-subjective dichotomy. You want to be completely isolated when you're, when you're looking at something. And what we're dis I guess what we're discovering is that it's impossible and that it's, it's not factual, as a matter of fact, that you determine what you see. And what you see is determined by that. But what I'm saying in otherwise words is that we live in a completely new universe. And that's what really uh, surprises me, that, every, uh, that I realize that in the 21st century, we are in a whole new reality. Well, I just go along with what Shirley was saying uh, relative to a group. And it seems to me that whether it's prayer, contemplation, meditation, that things start happening when you have a group of people who've decided they're gonna change the world. And until that happens, uh, then people are kind of playing games, I guess, with one another that when we, whatever we did in the Institute, we were out, we knew that this was helping us change the world. And the same thing is true uh, with, with Bonhoeffer, of course, that this group was out to change the world. Uh, and as a matter of, yes, and they knew, as a matter of fact, even more than the Institute, that if they did not change the world, they were going out of being. And as a matter of fact, that's what happened to them, that the other group uh, became more powerful and so destroyed them. And with, uh, with um, so that with today, again, pointing to the fact that I don't, I know that how you create the new, uh, the new uh, language, and that is when you get a, a group of people who want to change the world and they start using, they start articulating what that means. Uh, so that uh, in, in, in my case, it's, it's the young fella, it's Justin, uh, who wants to set about to change the world. And so what I say is, Justin, what is your group? 
and what is the poetry that you are giving to enable the group to change the world? I mean, you could, you could say that other ways too. Um, and my hope is that since Justin is a poet, that's his avowed uh, aim in life to be a, a writer and so forth, that he might do that. But that's the point where where I say I, I don't know. That I, I know what needs to happen, I, need, I know how it needs to happen, but I don't know what, what's going to happen. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, and legitimately so, it's kind of like uh, if you ask me, me, what does Shirley think? Well, I probably would tell you, uh, but <laughs> Well, especially if she's around, <laughs> I, better, I better say, you know, I know Shirley, I know the English language, but if you want to know what Shirley's thinking or saying, you better ask Shirley. <laughs> so with the, with the new, uh, in my case, I am comfortable living my life out of old paradigms that I will in my life, probably, uh, being very happy that I'm living my life intentionally, comprehensively, futurically. Uh, I will end my life being happy uh, that I pray, that I contemplate, meditate. But I am equally clear that if and when Benjamin, Sarah, Alex, when these people come to me and say, Grandpa, you really tried, but that ain't the way we're doing it. That isn't the, the way we're going to articulate it. Or Keenan, for instance. Then that's when I listen to them. Because I really don't know. It's mostly what we would call, I think, basically old mood. And uh, so that you keep an old mood until you find something better. It's like some, you know, it's like a lot of things in life, uh, especially uh, when supposedly when children are critical of their parents. Sometimes their parents say, well, you're right, but we're do doing the best we can. Now, when you get in our position, uh, you do better. And so that, again, the only thing that, that, that I'm clear on is you, you need a group of people who are out to save the world. Or, I mean, they have some kind of mission that really drives them. That they come together, they respect one another, they create a, a liturgy, and they repeat it often enough, they create a community, and it, they discover in the long haul that it sustains them. As, cre as crazy as they or other people might think it is, when they look at it objectively, like the daily office, for instance. And, and by liturgy, how would you talk about what a liturgy is? Well, I would say uh, a liturgy is, a long, is about 15 minutes in length. <laughs> That you have to take in, for instance, when uh, when How Justin you explain to Benjamin what yeah it is? when when ben, uh, when uh, Justin, for instance, and I come together, who, uh, Justin, Justin is a, well, one of the lost men who is 25 years of age. He's an anthropology major. He read uh, John Bagus' book on on Jesus. I didn't realize that Bagus. I uh, had a uh, doctorate in, in uh, anthropology. Justice, uh, Justin majored in anthropology. And he, he read Bagus' book and thought it was fine. Well, uh, and Justin does not come from a religious tradition. He comes from Noblesville, <laughs> uh, basically, which uh, tells you quite a bit about what his religious tradition is. But sometimes I say to him, uh, Justin 
the kingdom of God is at hand. And he says, Wandel, the kingdom of God is always at hand. And then I say, Justin, the kingdom of God is in the midst of us right now. And he says, Wandel, the kingdom of God is always in the midst of us. And I say, Justin, the kingdom of God has already begun. And he says, Wandel, the kingdom of God is always just beginning. Well, that's a little ritual, which is in another, another time's imagery. It's pointing to a reality, which, is, which they both understand. In other words, uh, what, you know, where are we now? What is this? How do we describe what we're doing? Well, this is reality. You know, and, and we have, we're either living reality right here or we're not. And so I think, I, I'm hoping you see that Justin at some point will say, maybe, uh, there's better, better ways of expressing this. And especially when Justin and Christopher Durden get together, who are these two, uh, the other fella is the fella who, uh, who uh, majored in, in mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology. When Christopher, that I'm hoping at some point, Christopher will say, well, why don't you use these terms? You know, make it relevant to today's youth. Well, you see, the thing is, the reason why <laughs> just dawned on me. The reason why you can't ask me about relevant terminology is if it is relevant to me, it won't be relevant to them. <laughs> and the reason why you won't be able to trust me when they use the new terminology is that I'm not familiar with it. So I'll think they're crazy. What do you mean? I, I would have to say that for me the sad part is there is no institution at the moment that is coming close to providing the daily office dynamic. And I don't even know how to go about creating it among the groups that I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. Because other what, what, what was that dynamic? Well, the daily gathering hmm? and the, the rehearsal of the historical story, the Old and New Testament. And finally, for me, the important part was the statement of faith by some member of the community which told you in a new way about your faith and it also told you about the state of the soul of the person who was making the witness if you had eyes to see and most of us did. That, that's very important to maintaining a community those, those factors, you, know, you, you need them all. And then the send out was very important. You knew you weren't going to stumble forth into the day. You were about being sent to a task, to a, to a way of enhancing your vision and the vision of the group. Very very empowering. I would, I would say, well, if you're serious about that question, then we have to sit down and talk a little bit about how you would create what I think are the essential pieces of that, and you have to create them out of your life experience. 
and we talk about that. I have been amazed at uh, mentioning these four children, uh, how these four children have lived their lives that um, when, when our kids get together, David, Anne, and Jane, I sometimes intentionally tell them, oh, I used to tell them that two out of, two out of the three uh, turned out quite well. And I said that story until at one point David said, well, we're equally happy because one of the two of the parents <laughs> turned out well from our perspective. So anyhow, since then I haven't stopped, the story. I stopped that story. But what I did tell them was that we've never, we have never, uh, Wendell hasn't, <laughs> has, uh, been concerned about how the kids have raised their families you know, what they've done. But our focus has been on the results. And that, you know, Alex and Emma are just splendid. Yeah, you know, they're I can't think of two more splendid people. Uh, and how they have used their talents, their creativity. <clears throat> and so I think for me, uh, I would rather than raising the I would want them to raise the question and then <clears throat> for us to be the pedagogues who say, now this is the question, how are you going to answer it? And you know, what, what are you out to do? What is your community? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Because I would have, uh, I would have no idea. Uh, and the one thing I do think, I'm not sure, is, <clears throat> that I would not say, well, sit down and I will tell you exactly how we did it 50 years ago. <laughs> so yeah, you can- That's about the last thing. Yeah, that's yeah. about the last thing. Although, you know, if they are honest, they will come up with, well, what were we talking about? Jargon. Mm -hmm. They will come up with you know, symbols. They will come up with stories. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, they're living it this weekend. You know, Brayton is <clears throat> in Princeton, New Jersey uh, with 300 other people. <clears throat> uh, and <clears throat> the question is uh, whether he will get a football scholarship to attend Princeton, for instance. Well, you know, this is, you know, this is the, the stories that these people are talking about, what their concerns are, and how they relate to it. And I think, you know, there's just so much life that's flowing in these people. And the question is, how do you make it intentional? How do you uh, how do you really see it in such a way uh, that you can really celebrate it for what it is? And uh, for me, for instance, when I look at, at Alex and Emma and, and I see, you know, maybe they're count when they look back uh, and they say, well, you know, this, this intrigue that grandma and grandpa had with this institute, with this order, <clears throat> we've had the same thing, the same intrigue with the world of the iPad, with technology that that brought us into a whole new world and a whole new way in which we then were, were it was made possible for us to relate to other people. And, it, you know, that might be how they change the world. Because, as I say, the one thing that I, that I think I'm, I'm clear about is that you have, <clears throat> in order to have intentionality, powerful symbols, you have to have people who are looking for them. And when they see them, they affirm them. And in the process, they're out to create them. And some of them do, and some of them don't. How would you talk about the um, 
the way in which the interior life informs a life of service and what happens externally and and vice versa and how um, uh, I mean, you both clearly live lives with um, a very strong social conscience and a very strong uh, social engagement or interaction. Mm -hmm. um, how um, how does one inform the other? Um, and if there's any message that you would want to send a, send along to the next generation, um, or or when do anything else on your agenda that you feel like um, you'd want to make certain and get captured to um, communicate to the 21st century generation, whatever. I was, uh, let's go back to the question you were asking before you went off of Wendell's agenda. I spent, <laughs> um, <coughs> the, the, Internal related to the external, or yes, I got mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes you spin yourself so fast yeah. in front of the question. Well, I was wondering to myself about how we enable uh, occasion in our grandchildren the kind of global consciousness that we see in our own children. For example, David St. John has just absolutely had what appears to me to be a frolic in this Midwestern, conservative, white business community that he moved into exposing them to the larger world and to people who have been educated and, in fact, born in other cultures. And people say to him, David, how, how did you learn to talk to these people, these people? And he'd say, well, I don't know. They've always been in my life. Well, Yes, and I think that's enormously important. Or, he, you know, people don't understand how he does so well with the Indians and hears what they're saying. And he doesn't usually say, well, in, when I was going into my freshman year in high school, I spent a summer in an Indian village, you know, and you learn a lot about hearing the language then, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we occasion that for our grandchildren? <clears throat> now, Jane has certainly worked at that by getting the kids to Japan. Mm. And uh, Benjamin was just, you know, was like, wow. I don't think it was such a a jolt for Jane or Sarah, and I don't know exactly why, but for Ben it was just great to go to Japan. Well, how do we get the other children out of this out of this community to that situation where they discover there is a larger world? Good work. Good work. Uh, for me, uh, getting back to the question of, uh, of needs and uh, vocation and talent, I think uh, one of the things that we can do is uh, be more creative about how we do communicate to people how they can discover their talents. For instance, around 15 years ago, uh, Karen was the one who gave me a book on positive psychology, you took, a, you took this very simple uh, test, or, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you discovered your signature strengths. And they were stated kind of poetically and so forth. 
so that uh, my, my number one signature strength uh, is an appreciation of, of, um, of excellence and beauty. So when, when I know that, then I can be more clear about how I use this to relate to the world. Now, relative to the world and its needs, it seems to me, again, that's where I sense younger people, I hope, are more sensitive in sensing what the needs of the world are. That a lot of people today, a lot of younger people, <clears throat> they are not afraid to say, I've gone to IU, now, after IU, I'm going to join the Peace Corps, I'm going to travel, I'm going to do one, two. They're not interested in the economic. That is only. And just parenthetically, you never know what you tell someone that will cause an, an awakening because of all of the things that Justin and I have talked about and the books he's read and so forth. The one that he comes back to again and again is the social process triangles. Mm. That when he says, Wendell, you know, I'm bumping to, you know, I bump into these people, I read these, these articles, these people are doing these crazy things. And I say, why are they doing this? And it's, then I realize it's because their social process triangle, the social process triangle of the world today is the economic is king. And so this gives him an added way also of seeing what the world needs. Because he says what the world needs is, it needs to change from the dominant being the economic to the dominant being the cultural. So he says the latest was reading, uh, uh, reading Monsanto this uh, chemical company, and discovering that with, uh, with the water and <clears throat> the fact that what they sense is there is a crisis in the world relative to water, water being polluted, it's this, that, and the other thing. And Mon according to Justin, Monsanto's response is, now how can we use this crisis in order to make a bundle of money. And Justin's response to that was so, I mean, he was so angry that someone would say, this global crisis, now how are we going to make money off of it? But then he, be, he said, you know, I began thinking, well, if their primary value is economic, there that's is. natural, that, there it is. So what he's out to do in that respect is change the entire society. So I think that's, uh, that's another part. But so that you never know uh, what, you're, what, you're, what you're telling people. And for instance, relative to our whole reflection today on the, on the order, you never know what did grab certain people, which made an enormous change. Uh, but that, given everything we did, if something did not grab a person, something else did. And I think that was, yes. the, yes. That was the, the gift to it all. Well, good words. Well, thank you both. We, we uh, really appreciate your taking some time to reflect. And, and as we say, we don't know uh, what seeds are going to awaken in what soil, but um, it's important to keep planting them. So, mm -hmm. and, and it's such fun. Yeah. Yes, and then I think uh, um, there was a, a journalist mm -hmm. who uh, went to, he, uh, he just graduated from IU. Uh, he went to his priest. He graduated from St. John's mm -hmm. Academy in a prep school in the East. He said, tell me someone in the community who lives a life of service because I want to write an article on service. The priest said, uh, interview Carrie Thompson. Mm. Uh,
Kerry Thompson then, but the, 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 the guy always, the last question, which the guy asks everyone. So now I've interviewed you, Kerry. Uh, who in the community would you suggest that I, that from your perspective? He said, Ann St. John. Ann St. John said, my parents. Hmm. When he interviewed us, then, I, then we said, now the person you need to interview next is Sarah Wolford. Hmm. Now, and I'm using this trend to, to, uh, with, with our reflection today, Michael, that I hope in about a year from now, hmm. or two years from now, or whenever, that you will, that some of these people will be in a position to answer more directly your question. Because what, what we've said today is we've gotten to the edge. Yeah. And we've said, now this is how they're going to articulate. This is when they're going to articulate. But what they articulate mm -hmm. is just as dangerous as Michael saying, Wendell, you tell me what Shirley's going to say. <laughs> it may or may not be right. It probably wouldn't. But with these, and with then these, you'd be in trouble. yeah, with these kids, I know that it wouldn't be right because I literally do not know their terminology. Uh, <clears throat> the book that we did not quote today was the Empathic Civilization, hmm. and it is a fellas attempt to completely refocus global society. Hmm. Now, what the guy, uh, the guy says is he ends with a statement on teaching science in the 21st century. And what I got out of that was that I have no idea of how you would do that. But I'm absolutely certain that the science that I got in, well, even in the 1940s, if you tried to use, <laughs> uh, teach that science in a high school today, <laughs> The kids would throw, the kids would throw you out. <laughs> so, so, but so my point is that there are people who are beginning to articulate the new science, and it, it will. Be, I think it will be enormously exciting to to hear how they articulate because I think that they are the same people who will give us the new terminology in, spirit, in what we've called spirituality. Now, one of the things we learned in the Institute was that when the person yes. at the head of the table Tables. ends the, the session, <laughs> you affirm Everybody, yeah. <laughs> don't move till you take your microphone. <laughs> See, I can Thank move. You. Thank you. <laughs> See, I can move, yeah. but you can't.